Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Sophia, for inviting me and for putting the show together. Um, thank you, of course, to Ulai, um, without whom obviously the, the exhibition and this event couldn't happen, but also without whom I think the history of, of contemporary art, but also fundamentally of performance art, basically wouldn't be what it, what it is. Um, so it's very humbling and uh, I'm very happy to be here, very humbling to be here talking to Ulai about his own work, which as Amelia pointed out is so it's quite intimidating in some ways. Um, so I, um, I'm going to read a, a section about There is a Criminal Touch to Art, um, a film made of an action in Berlin in 1976. The whole film is downstairs when you walk in, uh, installed on the wall against the, the reception of it. Um, and uh, as Sophia mentioned, I interviewed Ulai a few years ago uh, towards a book that you can have a look at out there, out there. And in the process, I was writing another book, which after speaking with Ulai and speaking with some other of his peers, um, I, I sort of threw out the book and started again. And so this is part of the new book um, about extremity. So I'll just read. Um, so Ulai tells me, <clears throat> quote, I, ca I certainly carried out a criminal act I was, at the very least, a thief, and it's a strange thief who surrenders. I was put in prison." End quote. The criminal act in question is the core of There is a Criminal Touch to Art, in which Ulai stole a priceless painting from the New National Gallery in Berlin in 1976. His pilfering of Karl Spitzweg's old oil painting, The Poor Poet of 1839, was executed as an action and should be understood as a work of art in its own right. It takes precedence in its extreme reanimation of the anti-art sensibility, literally here an attack on art, on a particular object, and on an august institution. As an avant-garde gesture, it provoked a kind of national insult. Um, it was an attempt at irritating, with political effects, the artist's implication with an ascent of German national identity in the post-war period. I discuss here the action as a, 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 in terms of a series of comments on art worlds, the material realities of privilege and poverty, and collective feelings of pride, propriety, and hypocrisy. When the case against Ulai came to trial in Berlin in early 1977, he recounts, quote, I was convicted and sentenced to 36 days in prison or a fine. I chose neither, end quote. Ulai conscientiously assumed his crime, larceny, for the theft of what art historians Reiner and Rosemary Hagen have called the German painting best loved by Germans. Um, Ulai bears the ethical mantle of his deed, but rejects outright the penalty, and implicitly the burden of contrition that would otherwise be demanded of the criminal for her or his crime. Ulai fled the country before sentencing, Ulai accepts the formal identity of criminality, but disavows his guilt, namely what Jean-Paul Sartre would call, with reference to Jean Genet, quote, the other's gaze that supervenes and cuts him off from himself, end quote. Genet's friends orchestrated his pardon from a life sentence for serial theft, while Ulai did eventually serve out a short sentence for his crime. Apprehended a few years later when passing through Germany in transit to Morocco, Ulai was jailed for 10 to 14 days. He, he can't remember precisely. Like Genet, Ulai is magisterially unrepentant. <laughs> Ulai's extremity, or his difference, begins with his name, derived from the first uh, syllables of his middle and last names, U Uwe Leisipen, um, his first and last, middle and last names by birth. Jacques Derrida writes in the course of an, of an analysis of Genet that a name may appear to be a natural occurrence, a birthright, or an effect um, of commerce, like a brand, um, um, as if it was an act without a past. However, to give something or someone a name is always, Derrida writes, quote, to sublimate a singularity and to inform against it, to hand it over to the police. To arraign is to ask for identity papers, for an origin and a destination. It is to claim and to recognize a proper name. How do you name without arraigning? Is that possible?" End quote. In Ulai's act of self-naming with an improper name, it resembles a moniker, a nickname, or perhaps a brand, Ulai stakes a claim to being without a regulated identity. 
He muddles the drama of being given over to the police by upending the social function of naming, and as if to say, who does Ulai think he is? Indeed, the lone name pl pl proliferates in the novels of Jean Genet, Mimosa, Divine, Darling, Corel. The lone name, the byname or cognomen, the single word as a name, stages what uh, Genet himself calls, quote, the sibylline effect of arbitrariness in the immaculate choice that remarks and abolishes to the point of infinity, end quote. The logic of self-obliteration, of abolishing oneself, um, twinned with self-fashioning, so germane to Genet, is res redolent to, in Ulai's name, but also in his work, um, to the extent that it signals the political and aesthetic stakes of his prime performance of extremity, namely, there is a criminal touch to art. On Sunday, 12th December 1976, at one o'clock in the afternoon, Ulai entered the new National Gallery in Berlin and descended the main staircase. He approached the poor poet, lifted it off the wall in a swift scooping motion and turned towards the camera with the painting in his arms. In the resulting film, uh, in the resulting film's first shots of Ulai, prior to the theft itself, the artist stands on a wooden ladder to attach a large reproduction of Spitzweg's painting above the entrance of the Hochschule der Bildende Kunst, um, unrolling it to block the Academy's doors. By commencing the action with a stunt that implicated the Hochschule, um, Ulai would use the ensuing theft to comment in part on a series of inequities in German art and culture, including the institutional marginalization of performance and of other experimental practices, of which Ulai was already a pioneer. As such, Ulai would associate his intervention directly with spaces of art beyond the museum, directly by quoting or criminally touching a series of institutions in the performance. After blocking the entrance to the Hochschule, Te uh, ten minutes into the film, Ulai arrives at his second destination, the New National Gallery in Berlin, uh, in Berlin's Kulturforum. After entering the museum's revolving doors, he opened an emergency exit and propped it ajar. Ulai assumed that the emergency exit would remain unlocked if tampered with. In museum security terms, this is referred to as a defeat of system maneuver, a countermeasure that compromises an otherwise effective security setup, the mu museum's alarm system and magnetic contact devices, for example. Ulai cut the painting's wires with plies, pliers, grabbed the poor poet, and ran. Less than a minute after snatching the painting, Ulai was free of the museum. Jörg schmidt Reitwein's footage shows Ulai sprint past the museum's modernist frontage with the painting lodged under his right arm wrapped in nylon, a sack whose size Ulai miscalculated. It was too small to envelop the frame. Three security guards give chase. Ulai recalls his legs seizing from fear or excitement and then falling. He was supine in the snow long enough for a guard to grab hold of his ankle. Ulai quickly shook himself loose and reached his van. Qu he tells me, I stole the painting using my hands and feet with no technology, no assistance, nothing. I knew I could do it." End quote. Such a seat of the pants approach seems cavalier or wild, um, but is actually, uh, a but is not in fact atypical in historical incidents of museum crime. Despite the tendency in films and novels to attribute art thefts to debonair white-collar thieves or organized crime syndicates, Anthony Amore and Tom Mashberg write that the reality tends to be far more grimy and far less romantic in their words and involves petty offenders or lone wolf individuals. They recount, for example, the opportunistic theft of Goya's Duke of Wellington um, painting from London's National Gallery um, it was stolen in 1961 through an unlatched, unlatched bathroom window by the elderly retired truck driver Kempton Bunton. Um, the Goya was held for ransom in order for Bunton to set up a fund to pay for TV licenses for fellow pensioners. <laughs> it was returned voluntarily in 1965, though Bunton served three months, incidentally not for the theft of the painting, but for the theft of the frame, which was never recovered. 
Ulai's Citroen stops in the sleeting snow in a car park a kilometer from his third destination, Kunstler, Kunstlerhaus Betanien, a studio of an exhibition complex for international artists at the time. Undertaking the remaining trip by foot, his body and the shot are in constant motion. At Batanian, Ulai pins a small colour reproduction of the poor poet crookedly to its notice board, obscuring an existing poster. Touching Batanian connects a sequence of venues across Kreuzberg in a vaguely straight line, an art academy, a museum and an exhibition space, which are blocked, depleted or defaced. In truth, the defacement is tentative. Uh, no lasting damage is incurred at any of the three venues and neither by the painting, though both lose space, perhaps. From Batanian, Ulay runs northeast to what was then a predominantly Turkish neighborhood. He stops at a phone, book and phone booth and calls the police to confess the theft and provide, provides an address on nearby Muskauerstrasse. The footage cuts to Ulay entering the humbly decorated home of a Turkish Gastarbeite family, um, a, work, a, a Turkish um, guest worker family. Um, a woman holds an infant in her arms and laughs towards the camera. Ulay re removes a framed reproduction from the wall and replaces it with the small square Spitzweg in its ornate frame, the painting stolen from the museum. The camera pitches and shows the patina of the canvas and the content, contents of its painted scene, obscured in the footage from the museum. Its first lucid representation, here, confirms the apartment of the Turkish guest worker family as the rightful setting in which to view the poor poet. The painting's hyperbolic depiction or appropriation of poverty and poetry, diluted and mystified by its canonization as a national treasure, is recontextualized by the actual poverty and pedestrian poetry of the modest family home. It, it is a romantic gesture of sorts on Ulai's part in its suggestion of the humility, dignity and authenticity of working class life. The film does not record his arrest. Ulay remembers that Dieter Honisch, the recently appointed director of the New National Gallery, arrived with the police, quote, saw the painting in its new setting and retrieved it. I was arrested. That was the end of the, that was the whole action, end quote. Nevertheless, the film continues with a visual epilogue of sorts. With a cigarette in his mouth, Ulay leans against layers of large reproductions of newspaper reports pinned to a wall, the ones reproduced downstairs. He rolls away each layer to reveal another story behind. Art theft was an action, reads one headline. Another lunatic robs world-famous Spitzweg painting. Ulai is productively evasive or ambivalent on the topic of how, precisely, the theft transmuted into or qualified as an aesthetic gesture. Quote, it's not up to me to declare the action a work of art, he tells me, shifting the necessary authority away from himself. Doing so, he continues, quote, was not important enough as a motive for doing the action. I succeeded in doing it, and that was all that mattered, end quote. In its ambivalent relation to the project of the historical avant-garde, it struggles against its own ontological security as either a criminal action or an art action. A precedent for theft as the technical and political basis of a critical art action can be seen in a rogue performance by the French artist Pierre Pinoncelli, who held up a bank in Nice in 1975 using a sawn off shotgun, robbing the teller of the token amount of 10 francs. Though formally similar, Pinoncelli stole money, not art, and the threat of violence represented by the shotgun is absent in Ulai's action. In its comparative subtlety and conceptual clarity, a stealth performance by the American artist Christopher D'Arcangelo provides a more apposite context for Ulai's intervention. On the 8th of March 1978, two years after Ulai's intervention, in one of his little remembered museum pieces of 75 to 79, D'Arcangelo visited the Louvre in Paris, removed Gainsborough's conversations in a park of 1740 from the wall and placed it on the floor. After his stealth reinstallation, D'Arcangelo attached to the wall a printed statement which asked in part, quote, when you look at a painting, where do you look for that painting? What is the difference between a painting installed on the wall and a painting installed on the floor, end quote. In a, startlingly in a startlingly simple work of institutional critique, 
D'Arcangelo's action highlighted the privilege endowed by or withheld from the viewer by museums. My, by making unfamiliar the incidental viewer's sight lines, he stages how an institution manufactures the physical locus of looking, whether we look parallel to or down upon a painting may distort the perceived value of the object one encounters and therefore changes the meaning in it, um, it is empowered to produce. Ulai has described the Berlin action, so the action that underpins the, uh, the film, in terms that emphasize its prescience as what one might call guerrilla curating. He tells me, quote, I loaned or borrowed the poor poet without permission, of course, end quote as opposed to stealing the painting, which suggests an intention to retain it in perpetuity or to sell it or ransom it, Ulai borrows the painting. Its return remains latent in its movement around the city. Not so much violating sacred spaces, Ulai touches and therefore connects relevant sites to revalue and rework the ways language attaches itself to actions or to objects, to re revalue Oh, so which accrue significantly different meanings when appropriated into the space of performance. My action was conceptual, he explains, even if it departs from the typical low intensity and emotional aridity of his contemporaries in conceptual art. Like think of Solowit or uh, Joseph Kosuth or um, um, Lawrence Wiener, the uh, constitutive difference, I think, but all conceptual. Um, by appropriating and recontextualizing the poor poet, Ulai was careful not to damage the work. Rather than detract from, it, detract from its symbolic appeal, he added an additional value to the painting. As a guerrilla curator of sorts, Ulai was able to insert the painting and its history into a new context, um, although uh, through which it accrued new meanings. Um, as my, so, so, the, so this kind of idea of like accruing new meaning through putting it in a, a surprising position or relation, I think this, this, is what any, this is what happens to any object relocated or inflected by effective curatorial practices, um, itself at times a creative and legitimate process of appropriation. So just very nearly finishing, the poor poet was both an inspired choice and an incidental one. The painting and its cultural history enabled a precise series of political effects when Ulai stole and reinstalled it in the course of his performance. Spitzweg was born in 1808 and became a, a pharmacist in 1832. In the late 1830s, he taught himself to paint by copying Dutch masters in the Pinotech in Munich. In, uh, Spitzweg created paintings of bourgeois individuals and groups landscapes and pastoral scenes, neoclassical sketches of nudes and statuary, some of which are flagrantly, are flagrantly homoerotic, and cartoons and society portraits. Spitzweg would become popular among the masses after his death in 1885, but the intelligentsia considered him a hack in his lifetime. In Stealing the Poor Poet, Ulai sought to irritate the institutions of art and the state. Indeed, the film is sometimes referred to by the title Irritation to uh, distinguish it from the live action it documents. Indeed, Spitzweg was an exemplary target in this regard. Uh, Adolf Hitler was a noted and prolific collector of the painter and his circle. The Führer Museum, the Linz Collection, contains 50 paintings by Spitzweg. And Albert Speer recalls Hitler's fondness for Spitzweg's, quote, staunch middle-class genre quality and affable humor, end quote. In the 1970s, the poor poet remained a monument of German popular painting. Indeed, a poll in Germany ranked the painting as at one time the people's second favorite work of art after the Mona Lisa. The narrative force of the painting pairs in, um, enmeshes the poet in the solitary act of poetic invention, and pairs the spectacle with the black wood burner in the left-hand side of the frame. Um, as the poet hones his craft, a stack of manuscripts hangs from the stove, ready for burning, for the writing of manuscripts has exacerbated the poet's poverty, preventing him from affording firewood. He is burning his poems to stay warm and to dry his wet boots, um, a hat hung on the chimney stack and a towel suspended on the line. Um, a further stack of poems wrapped in string sits on the floor also awaiting the fire. 
The top sheet of the stack is partially legible and suggests the frame Operum Maorum Fasciculum Tribus, or My Collected Works Part 3. In a dis different reading, the hat perched on the stove's flue suggests that the oven is cold, therefore emphasizing the wretched situation of the, po the poet's material extremity. The poet's pose may suggest he is picking out a rhythm of a line or has found a flea which has pierced his reverie. <laughs> One or the other. Um, across variant readings, um, his persistence in his craft becomes a testament to the artist's magical transcendence of the situation of his own impoverishment, precisely through poetic reverie, even to the extent that deprivation or pain temporarily brings him down to earth. Um, Ulai tells me, when I was at school in Germany in the late 1940s, I had a textbook and its only colour image was a reproduction of the poor poet. That tells you how iconic the painting was for German identity in that period. Everybody identified with it. I thought, if I get my hands on it, hell might break loose." End quote. World War II and its aftermath, the drudgery and solitude of er Ulai's early adulthood, and his turn to activism in the mid-60s seemingly incited in him a heightened sense of disgust for Germany's national victimhood and its lack of authentic social and individual contrition and guilt. This was expressed ruefully in a work Ulai created in Paris in 1974, a printed funeral card for himself that reads in German, my farewell as a singular person. By picturing a funeral for himself and sloganizing his demise, Ulai killed off, not finally, but serially and theatrically, um, the, the part of his identity that gave him pause prompting a conceptual self-erasure, a presentiment of social death, and a subsequent commitment to reinvention and to collaboration, as Amelia has been talking about. Ulai does not identify with the poor poet in the painting, but rather critiques the figure's romantic function. He deploys his critique by way of his forcible relocation of the painting, again, it's not stolen, it's borrowed, um, to curate a new means of, vi of viewing the economic disparities at work in the art world and in the broader regime of the social, as signaled by the criminal touches, his criminal touches, across four sites in the city. Or, as Ulai tells me in typically more diffident terms, quote, I needed to deal with my Germanness. I wanted to irritate it, and I did it best by stealing Germany's favorite painting, end quote. Among his criminality and his wildness, which retain their own clarity, Ulai remains unwilling to stake a claim to certainty, stability, coherence, or coherence. Oh, sorry, sorry. Ulai remains unwilling to stake a claim to certainty, stability, credibility, or coherence. Maybe he's just stubborn, happy, or generous, too prone to letting go, or much too careless with his grandeur. His calm is that of the iconoclast. Thank you.